Hi, everyone. David Kessler here. I'm here with Gloria, my friend. We're going to talk about her in a moment. But uh, hey, Gloria, good to see you. Hey, David. It's wonderful to see you and great to be on. I love it. All right. I'm going to just going to give folks a few moments to find us live here tonight. All right. It'll take a moment for us to be seen and see and all that good stuff. But hopefully we'll come up in a moment. Trying to, I always try to see us on here. I see people are saying hello. So that means they're seeing us, even though I haven't found us. I actually try on my phone to find us. Just, oh, there we are. Good. It's a nice just a reminder that we're here. So I don't know, even if you're old enough to remember or you remember, there was a romp, a show romper room years ago. And uh, the teacher used to pretend like she sees everyone. So I do that. I'm like, Diane <laughs> here from Southern California, Shirley's from PA, uh, Robin's from New York. Hi, Robin. Diane's from Virginia. Uh, Jennifer's from Alaska. What's the oh. weather like in Alaska right now? Ivy's here from New York City. Karen's here. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. I put up a post that we were coming on at six. I hope that you all saw that. Uh, Diane's here from Texas. Good to see you, Diane. Lori's here from New Hampshire. Well, we're here from all over. Betty from Ohio. Good to see everyone. Sandra from Maryland. I'm coming to you from Los Angeles. And Gloria, you're in? Carmel, California. Carmel. Very nice. So we're here from, I'm under a curfew. You don't have, do you have a curfew there? No curfew. Thank you. You just started a moment ago, so I'm safe inside with you. <laughs> All right. Annette's here from Tennessee. Teresa's here from Upper Michigan. Marie from Brooklyn. Uh, Jennifer says Alaska is sunny and beautiful. Jolene mm -hmm. from Phoenix. Martha from San Francisco. Mary from New York. Well, I'm glad you're all here finding your way on. And uh, as we do, uh, if you're new, I'm David Kessler. Set up this group after COVID-19. So many people, their grief groups were closed down. People weren't able to say goodbye to their loved one. If you needed support because you were struggling with grief, you didn't have anywhere to go. If you were newly bereaved, so we came together virtually here. And uh, in the evenings, I have a different guest on because there's many voices in grief. As you've probably learned, there's not one way to do grief. There's certainly not a right way to do grief. So I love hearing from people in the evening who've experienced loss and, uh, our guest tonight, Gloria Horsley, is Dr. Gloria Horsley, is certainly a teacher of mine, and um, uh, I'm so thrilled she's here. But we are all here because someone we loved has died. So if we could just first take a moment to honor them, to send them love, to just dedicate a moment to them, if you would join me in a moment of silence. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Gloria, we're going to give you the family rate. We've had your daughter on. <laughs> she was one of the first people who came on. I say family rate. Everyone here is volunteering their time to come on. But uh, Heidi was here. And uh, uh, how's she doing after COVID? I know that she told us she was recovering. Mm -hmm. She's doing really well. Uh, it was scary. Scary for us, particularly as a bereaved mom of many years still. Uh, having uh, my child get COVID, she's a very adult child, but having her get COVID was a scary thing. And my husband and I weren't by her and we were connecting with her by telephone and by internet and she's doing really well. Uh, she's been a trooper. She was uh, quarantined and they brought food to the door and she showed us her mask and gloves. She was in Arizona and I'm in California. So she showed us the mask and gloves and she got through it really well, but I, I have to say, she said it was very scary at night because uh, she was in that room alone and with the breathing problems uh, that you have with it, it's, it's very scary, you, you know, but she got through it. She's doing well, but she doesn't have her sense of smell or taste back. <laughs> so wow, I hear that takes a long time and it feels yeah. like for people I've talked to, it takes a lot, it has a long tail. Yeah, it's they're talking about months. To it. Right. Yeah. 
So, so Gloria, I, I mentioned you've been one of my teachers and you've been a teacher, not probably because, well, I don't know. I'll be curious to hear uh, one, how you came into this world. And I don't know if you were a professional in this area before your own story. So tell us how you came into this world of grief and loss. Interesting that you should ask me that, David, because people don't ask me that very often. And the reality is I was very much in the world of grief and loss. I actually was kind of, um, I taught at the University of Rochester Medical Center and I was a clinical nurse specialist in psychiatry and my specialty was grief and loss. Oh. And uh, I remember before my 17 year old son was killed in a uh, fiery automobile accident, I remember going to a family, I used to consult on the whole surgical service at, at the University of Rochester Medical Center. And I remember going to uh, a room of a young man who'd had a van roll over and his brother was killed. And I was also a, a family therapist. And when I went into the room, the family was there. And I remember saying to them, well, you know, I have some things that I think could help you, uh, but uh, this doesn't happen to me. and uh, you know, I think this will help you, but I do, honestly don't know exactly what you're going through. And man, it happened to me three days later. And I can tell you, I did not have the foggiest idea what that family was going through. Wow. I, you know, and, and I think I had some things that helped him on the, the way, but I remember I, I read all the grief and loss. This was in 1983. So it's been a long time ago. And I was very much involved with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross material and I taught it and it was around that time in the beginning of hospice. I worked with AIDS patients. I worked on a burn unit, which I think is very key. I consulted to a burn unit at that time and I was doing some research being, uh, if you've ever had a burn, it's very, very painful if you're on a unit because they do something called tubbing and scrubbing where they actually put you in a tub and scrub off all your scabs every day. Mm. I mean, I can't tell you how excruciating painful that is. So I was doing some work on meditation with those people that were having the tubbing and scrubbing because they can't meditate those people to medicate them all the time. So, um, and then guess what? Three days uh, after I was in that room, so I knew all about burn, burn units and all that. My son was driving in uh, Maryland with his cousin. It was very rainy. His cousin was driving the car hydroplane. They hit a wall, the car literally blew up and they burned to death. So I will say over, it's been many years now and over the years, I, you know, you just find these small fragments of things that you realize that have been fateful that I wouldn't say God has helped me out. I understood what it was like had he lived and been severely burned. So, you know, uh, he died immediately in the accident. So. You know, I mean, you find these weird little constellations along the way. Right. So anyway, that's, you know, how my, uh, I was very interested in hospice and grief and loss before Scott died. And one of the things I l like to think is that I was immaculately prepared for the experience. Even though I knew the material, I had to take the trip. Right. You know, it didn't matter how educated, how much I knew, how many people I'd worked with, I took the trip. Right. And it's not an easy trip. And we've talked about this before because we've we've shared that idea about, you know, knowing this academically mm -hmm. is very different than living it. Yep. It is. Know, and as you know, I've, I've always said, after my younger son died, I wanted to write a note to every bereaved parent I counseled saying I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, because that's said, uh, David, I just want to say uh, what I didn't realize about it was it's a physical experience. It's like hitting a brick wall going in 90 miles an hour. I mean, it honestly, I think it takes a year to recover your physical balance. And, you know, I, I know that people who've had kids die of cancer and that kind of thing, or family members die of cancer, they say, well, it prepares you for it and you're better. Well, I think immediately you look better, but down the road, you gotta take the trip with everybody else. And, and, uh, and I have never been with a family where it didn't shatter them when they said they're dead, when it's kids or whatever, because there's always hope when you have a, a younger person, you know, 
if, if you're older, maybe it's not a shattering, but if you, I mean, I'm not even, I don't even say that because I know there are people who live with their 90 year old parents that are shattering. So, you know, but when they actually are not with you anymore and they've actually passed away and that spirit and soul has actually left that body, it's really something. Right. And I know, uh, you from Open to Hope. I also know you from Compassionate Friends. Can you tell us how those began with you or how they intersected with you in your life and your loss? Kind of interesting because I really didn't do a lot with grief and loss after Scott. I was basically on an existential journey. I did things with Carolyn Mace and Byron Katie and I taught for them and I, I actually took, I joined, uh, the, it was the Association of Death Educators, now it's called the ADAC. Um, I actually put on my professional hat mm. and kind of went into the grief and loss world more. Well, when I did, I don't know, I don't want to say I put, I put on, I did. I got connected with some powerful, wonderful people through my academia. I was able to get close to them. They taught me. I learned so much from people like Byron Katie. I know you had her on last night, but you know, over the years, and I did the Enneagram with a woman named Helen Palmer, who actually brought it into the first book, personality typing. And uh, you know, I uh, um, trying to stabilize, find myself, and uh, it was. I, I want to say it's been a wonderful trip in the all in all. But that's how I got into it. The the way I got into the compassionate friends was. Um, they asked me, uh, oh, I went to one of their meetings because Heidi was trying to get uh, a, a sample for her PhD. <laughs> so I said, well, let's go over to the Compassionate Friends. And she wanted to do a PhD on sibling loss. So we went over to the Compassionate Friends and I met Pat Loader, who was uh, the head of it. And I said, you really should have a professional day and give continuing aid credit. So she said, Oh yeah, well, why don't you do it? I said, okay, I'll do it for three years. <laughs> I don't know why I ever said that. So I ran their professional day for three years and met some wonderful people. I ended up going on the board. And then they asked me 14 years ago if the internet was just coming into play and Pat said, would you do an online radio show? And I said, no. And then I thought about it and thought, I didn't know anything about the internet or anything. And then I thought, I've never done a radio show. I thought I've, I'd done a lot of family therapy video stuff. And so I said, all, all right, I, I'll try it. And honestly, I signed up for eight weeks. It was pay to play, signed up for eight weeks. And after six weeks, I got an email from this woman said, I see you're only doing two more shows and I want you to know you're my lifeline and please don't quit. Mm. Whoa. So it still takes my breath away when I think about just even impacting one person in the world to have somebody say that I was their lifeline. It was like, wow. And we were talking about grief, grief loss and recovery and giving a voice to grief and recovery. And then I, I, so I kept on and Heidi said, mom, you're not talking about sibling loss and it's discounted. And I'm like, well, then you'll have to join me. Right. And so Heidi joined me. And so we've been doing a podcast and radio show for uh, over 14 years. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been quite. quite and that's good. called Open to Hope. Mm -hmm. And tell me about that name. Well, we, we started doing the radio show and it got so Big and and then people want to talk about um, spouse loss and uh, about parent loss. One of our biggest visits is adults losing parents, and I said well, we just can't, Heidi. We're going to have to do our own uh, place to put this show because it's not just child loss anymore. It's it's broadened. So uh, we uh, decided that we would have to we would do our own website and start our own foundation. So frankly, for tax reasons that we would do our own foundation. So we got together with a person who names things and, and we went on a big whiteboard and we went, she put all these things down and made this Venn diagram and we just threw down words and, and, 
and we came up well, hope was a big word for us hope and then i said no 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 i don't want to tell people to be hopeful right if, if you just had a loss i don't want to tell people what to do i said i just want to say oh i know how bad it is just open yourself to the idea that there could be hope again you know and that's how we got it open to hope right so tell me there's i've been looking at some of the comments there is so many people here have just that, and I'm using their word, but we could all use it at different times. They're in the unbearable pain. Mm. Yep. And a lot of people have had children who have died. They've had people, spouses who've died, parents who died. What do you say, what have you learned about that unbearable pain? The first thing I think of is you got to take care of yourself so that you can bear it, so that you can bear the unbearable. And, you know, you got to drink water, go for walks. I mean, I remember I was just so destroyed when Scott was killed that after two weeks, I, I hadn't left the house. And, and all of a sudden, a little voice came into my head and it said, if you don't go out and run, because I used to run and I'm not like an Olympic runner, just, you know, and I was in my 40s and a voice said to me in my head said, if you don't go out and run, you're going to get sick. And I argued a little bit in my mind. I said, no, 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 you know, I'm not going to get sick. And then it kept saying, so I remember putting on my running shoes and I headed out the door and it, it was hell because I knew that all my neighbors were looking out the window and they were saying she doesn't really care about him because if she did, she wouldn't be out taking care of herself. And that was crazy, so clear in my mind. And it was a while before I didn't feel like I shouldn't be doing this. I should be showing people, you know, I should be, you know, I should be devastated. You know, and and I and the thing was that person who asked that question, you, you are devastated. I mean, it's so painful and you've got to take care of your physical body so you can bear bear the unbearable and it gets better. I always tell people it'll get better. It gets better if you will let it get better, if you will take care of this mortal body so that you can bear it. Right. And I think we want to be in different places than we are. I think we have the outer world telling us we should be in a different place. And I think we even have expectations. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There. Yeah. People are, are maybe saying they want you to be who you were. They want you to be like they were. They want you to be back. You know, and they want to help you and they want to fix you. And they, you know, and, and, you know, they just want the old glory back and the hey the old glory is never coming back right. but over time i think it's a better version frankly it, yeah and I, I often think about them wanting the old gloria back with the old david or the old susan or bill or whoever it may be and it's i often say when someone says can you talk to my sister we just we miss the old susan <laughs> i bet susan misses the old susan but we can't get the old Susan back because we can't bring her son or her daughter back. Right. So she's kind of forced to deal with the new Susan. And I guess we got to learn to deal with the new Susan. But not everybody will. Not everyone will. The thing I have to tell you, find yourself good grief support. It's so fascinating. I had new friends. I had people who never showed up before. Suddenly they were at my door and they be and they did wonderful little things for me. Like I'll never forget this one family that we barely knew. Um, it was Christmas time and uh, he Scott died in April, May, June, July, August. It was about seven months later at Christmas time. Um, they became little elves and put little gifts on our door every every day, you know, at, during the holidays. So, and I didn't know that family. And they became one of the most blessed families in my life. So there will be people that will show up that are good grief support. And hey, don't give up on everybody. You might go back later. Don't worry about them now, but in, th in three years, two years, you might go back. Also, 
there are some people who are good uh, to take you, well, you can't go to a movie now, but don't forget the people that want to take you to a movie or whatever. Don't, I mean, not everybody has to be good grief support. If they've, if all they've got for you is to take you to the gym or something like that, go to the gym with them. What the heck? Yeah, I, I often think about those, you know, sometimes we may go our superficial friends, you know, my superficial friend can't <laughs> have a deep conversation with me. All they care about is the latest movie or the latest theater. And I'll go, did you have conversations with them about the latest movie or theater? Well, yes, but not anymore. And I'll go, someday you yeah. might want that distraction. <laughs> exactly. You might get tired. You know, there's a time where you know, one of the things I know is after my son died, I would go to the gym and there's someone I would work out with. And I, I it wasn't right away. It took me a long time. I never told the person I worked out with that my son had died. Mm -hmm. I I wanted one little corner of my life to just go in and just lift weights and just not be the grieving parent just for like an hour. Right. <laughs> you know, I, it didn't last forever, but I just wanted that little bubble for a moment. And you, and sometimes you want to go to places you've never been with the person too. Right. You know, on a vacation or whatever. You just want to go somewhere where you're not yearning and searching. How long does it take that yearning and searching and thinking you see them? You know, you see a, a head of hair or, you know, that reminds you of their hair or whatever. The yearning and searching is really unbelievable. Right now, I'm supposed to be in Australia before everything got canceled. Mm -hmm. And the last time I was in Australia, two, three years ago on tour, I was on a bus and 10, 20 seats ahead of me. I saw someone who looked just like my son, David, from the back. Mm -hmm. And I sat back there going, should I look? Should I look? I mean, and there's a part of me that goes, it can't be him, but should I look? And I eventually, as he was getting off, sort of ran up just to look and saw it wasn't him. And I thought I needed to do it that way, that time. I think the next time I probably won't. Yeah. I'll just let it be and just enjoy that glimpse for a moment. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think we all have to do. I mean, that's the thing. Everyone has to discover this journey for them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. No question. You've had so many guests on your podcast and your shows. What have you learned from all of them? My gosh, I learned something from people on a regular basis. I think, uh, you know, the the way people cope, the way they deal with it, the courage that they have, and it, it's just uh, amazing. It blows me away. You know, uh, I remember somebody uh, made the comment that grief is really longing for the unavailable. That just happened to me about five weeks ago, and I thought... Grief is longing for the unavailable. That's what her grief was. Wow, yeah. interesting. Now, you know, one of the things that you do in your work is you bring a lot of different voices to grief. Mm -hmm. Every night I bring a different voice to grief. Last night was Byron Katie. Right. Some people, I see people are still posting. <laughs> Some people loved it. Some people were like, what is this? <laughs> Thoughts on that? On um, Byron Katie. It's interesting that, you know, longing for the unavailable. And we talked about with Byron, no, they're available. That's just a thought. Yeah, right, right, right. But forget that they ever were available. I don't know. <laughs> longing, longing, longing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, uh, I like bringing different people on. There's no one right way to do grief. There's no one right person to tell us. And I hope, you know, people grab just a snippet here and a snippet there that sort of helps them. Absolutely. I, and it, that was the way it was with me. If you, if anywhere I went somewhere and I'd get one small thing, I'd think it was great, you know, and you just got to 
it's, it's a exploration. It's an exploration of your new world, your new life, the new you, the new whatever. I mean, it's you. It's like you're born again as a different person after you've had a, a traumatic loss. Right. Can you do some questions? Sure. Love it. Okay. Anyone who has a question, please let us know. Just post it. I will look and see uh, as questions come in. Um, Susie says, it's only been four months and I'm tired of grieving. I need a break from being sad. I don't want to look at pictures that remind me my son won't ever have whatever experience was being captured there again. Just not now. Mm -hmm. Wow. Four months is really early. I, I will have to tell you that I think the first year is like a time when you are saying, okay, I got through this. I got through that. It's a time of being proud of yourself, you know, kind of like I made it. I made it through the first birthday. I made it through, you know, all these events. One of the things I think, Susie, it's important, again, physically, I think, especially, I don't, it's such a hard time now. you got to figure out how to take care of yourself physically. But also, remember that first year that, the anticipation for me of events were worse than the event. Right. The and that first year, the anticipation that the birthday's coming up or that Mother's Day is coming up or whatever. When the day comes, you get through it. So hang in. It's uh, right. And I do. I tell people, you know, when people go, "Oh, the anniversary of their loved one's death is coming up." What should I say to them or call them that day? And I'm like, call them days before. They're in it. Right. Already. They're, That's they're right. already going through it. You think it starts at 6 a.m.? <laughs> oh, no, they're in it four days before. Exactly. Patricia says, I lost Tanya nine months ago. I get angry, sad, depressed. I was never like this. Yeah. It's, it's challenging grief. It's challenging, challenging, deep grief. Yep. Again, nine months. It's half that. That first year is really, really rough. The second year is hard too for people who ran it for different reasons. I say this to people: the first year, I, I can only speak for myself, really knowingly. But the first year, I was frozen. I call it frozen grief. The second year, sometimes you don't. You feel worse because you're facing up to everything. And I say to it, it's because you're thawing out. And when you think you're getting worse, you're getting better. And by the way, six months can be the height of dep uh, a very depressing time for people. But as you feel, you may feel like you're getting worse. People think grief should be like, okay, I'm going to get better every day. I'm going to make progress. I'm going to feel better. It's been nine months. And, and family members expect them. You know, okay, it's been nine months. You know, we, uh, you know let's move along here. It's not the way grief is. It, and, and it feels a little worse sometimes when you're getting better because, as I say, you're thawing out, you're realizing, okay, crap, this is really the way it's going to be. And you're starting to, your, your body and your mind are starting to let a little more of the reality in. But if you take care of yourself, trust yourself, you're going to be okay. Right. How long has it been since your son died? Oh my gosh, she died in 1983. <laughs> you had that out. It's been a long time. Long, long and time for 30 years. What would you say about your grief around him today differently than then? He's my guiding light. I celebrate him. Uh, he was, an, I mean, uh, he's an amazing person wherever he is and whatever he's doing. And, uh, you know, if I really look into into it, uh, he would have been married and had a wife and all that kind of thing. <laughs> I said to my husband the other day, this is weird, but, you know, we had the best years of his life for our, for me because he was uh, 17 years old. I adored him. He was our boy. He never got married and moved on and had kids. And so uh, I wish he'd been able to do all that. But I do celebrate those 17 years. They were special and precious years. And uh, people are afraid they'll forget. Oh, my gosh, I want to tell you, you will never forget. Right. And you will love those memories. And uh, being this long, uh, I've got grandkids, and we talk about Scott and with them. And uh, I don't know. It's just uh, 
I do it with joy now. Occasionally, something will really touch my heart. You know, I'll get, tear up and all that kind of thing. And you never know when it's going to hit you. But um, yeah, I'd rather have that. I'd rather feel that tinge hit me than not have it. Right. You know, it's it's special. It's been, I think, I don't know. It's been like forty-five years since my mother died, and you don't forget people. You no. just don't forget. We worry we're going to forget, but it just doesn't happen. It doesn't yeah. happen. My mom too, and my dad, and you know, and different things with different people. When you when your mom uh, dies, you lose a historian of the family. You can't call up and find out about everybody, and you know, they're just different things about different people that are that are so special, and you know, they're always with us in the fabric of our lives. Someone asks if you have dreams of him. I, do, I used to a lot more than I do now. Uh, I think that I don't have dreams about him anymore because he's kind of in reality for me now. Um, he He's part of, uh, like, I have the opportunity to talk about him today. So, um, you know, I have a lot of, so I don't dream about him because I talk about him. And he did appear to me early on in a very special dream. And uh, that was kind of one of those healing dreams that I had. And I know healing connections. And we find dimes. <laughs> the whole family finds dimes in all sorts of crazy places. And, you know, so there's all sorts of connects like that. Right. Kathy says, I seem to be getting worse instead of better. I lost my 47-year-old daughter to a massive heart attack a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And now, and I have no desire to leave my house. The virus is giving me an excuse I need not to. Mm -mm. Okay, well, remember what I was saying. Uh, it's been a year and a half. The second year can be really, really a challenging year because it's the year, that second year, this is it. It can be a little bit depressing. But I would say to you, if you, is it, what was her name? I think it was Kathy. Kathy. I would say to you, Kathy, you, uh, after a year and a half, I can hear you saying that you're not sure that you like what you're doing with your life right now. You're not sure that it's right, that it's best for you. And that's a good hit. And it's good that you have come on and said that today because you are looking into the fact that you don't want to leave. So you're not feeling totally comfortable about it. So I would say to you, it's probably a time for you to reach out. And you are reaching out and do more of it. Because I think it's going to be good. You do need to get out. After two years, you really need to start moving along. Because in the third year, you're generally ready to say, okay, you know, I need to get something going. So, but I want to say that, you know, people can minimize losing a 47-year-old daughter. Because it wasn't a kid, a baby or whatever, for God's sake. And she probably had kids or whatever. I want to tell you that it is just as painful and my heart goes out to you. Martha says, my son died eight weeks ago. I'm always exhausted. I don't want to leave my house, struggling every day. I have a wonderful grief therapist, and my oldest son has been a huge support. I feel like I'm relying on my oldest son too much. Wow. Four months. That's like an hour and a half ago in Two grief, months. isn't it? Hmm? Pardon? That's hour and a half ago in grief time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You are in such short grief time. Rely, lean on everybody you can right now until you are able to reach out and help people. If you lean on other people, listen, you need to give people the opportunity to help you. It's an opportunity and it is a privilege to help somebody who's in early grief. Let those people that are good support, if, you're, if your son's a good support person, lean on him. You'll get through it. You'll be able to then help him. You'll be able to move out and help other people. But start out by letting people help you. As I say, it's such a privilege. And I would just add to that, just from my experience with my older son, you know, part of our job as parents is to demonstrate grieving for our kids. Absolutely. And demonstrate continuing to live. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we got to be careful not to just demonstrate grieving because we don't want them to become our grief counselors either. No. All right. Yeah. They'll resent that later and we don't want that. Mm -hmm. 
you know, if you, if you say if you feel like you're leaning too much on him, then find some other people to lean on to bring in, bring in some troops, go to your minister, call the house, call your local hospice and ask them who the best grief counselors are. If you don't know, or they might have some free people if you can't afford it. Uh, call your community centers, find out who's in your local area that can give you help and support and, you know, shop for a grief counselor. You better get somebody who knows something about grief and loss. Yeah, if you go to grief.com, we have a directory there. Uh, a lot of groups, a lot of counselors. So check that out. The other thing I knew, I knew the pain of my son dying was too much for me to hand any one person. Mm -hmm. I knew I had to spread it out far and wide. Mm -hmm. And, you know, any part of me, I don't know if you had people who believe you should be able to handle it since you were a professional. <laughs> oh. There was no part of me that thought, since I'm a grief expert, I should be able to do this because I knew it was different. It was my son. Right, right. I had to. I worked in a, a hospital and I had all these psychiatrists that were watching me 24 seven. And one of them pulled me in and said, uh, I gave, gave, basically gave me a assessment. And I looked at him cause I was at work and I said, you know what? I cry on my own time. I'm not going to cry on yours. So, you know, people ha have to do what they do and you, and we have to work and we have to buck it up and, but you've got to find people, as you said, David, you got to spread it out and figure out and also maybe do some compartmentalizing of your grief so that you can work and do the stuff that you need to do. And as you said, don't grieve too much around your kids. It depends on how old they are, but they're going to be watching you. So, yeah. What I also found with my older son, and he was 23 at the time. There was a point whenever he would come to visit, I wanted to talk to him about his brother. Mm. I wanted to connect around that. And I realized if every time he comes to visit, it's a grief session, mm. he may not come to visit. Right. And I've sort of learned to some of that spread it around and let him bring it up with me. Mm -hmm. You know, you just made a good point about you wanted to talk about it because one of the most important things as far as I'm concerned is to tell your story. I say to people, find people you can tell your story to, how it all happened. You just can't tell it enough. And I like to tell the story till I got bored with my own story. Every time you find a story, uh, tell your story, it takes on a little bit different bent so that's why i love groups because uh you get a chance to tell your story to the group and when you hear other people's stories it builds on your story and makes you realize some things right and what do you say to people who uh they share that you know they feel like they're in a world that their spouse died or a parent died and they feel like there's so much grief worse than theirs and their spouse dying in the world isn't as bad as someone who's had a child die. Mm -hmm. I think, well, I know the only thing you can know is your own pain. You really can't know it. You can empathize with people, but to really know the pain, you've got to have it yourself. And that's what I learned from my son dying. So, you know, if the worst thing that's ever happened to you is I used to say this, a hangnail, then a hangnail is a hell of a thing. So, you know, you just can't know. And uh, spouse loss, uh, loss of parents, it's, you know, if that's your loss, that's your loss. If that's a loss that's knocked you down on the ground and you can't get up from, that's it. Right. And the thing is, I always say, Gloria, you and I have both lost sons. Mm -hmm. And I will never know what it's like for you. And you will never know what it's like for me. Right. And so we really can't ever know another's pain. Mm -mm. Um, Annette says, I am a feel like I'm afraid of the next tragedy that's going to happen. Mm. Did you ever feel that after your son died? Like, oh my gosh, like even with coronavirus and your daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Already just recently I was concerned about it, but I will tell you, I was really paranoid after Scott died. Uh, I had a 14 year old daughter at home and, 
two older daughters, but they were both in college. And uh, I was panicky. I remember panic, Heather, this is before cell phones, and uh, Heather uh, had gone to a party and it was like nine o'clock at night and one of Scott's friends came over to visit us and he could see that I was frantic. He could just see that I was upset about Heather, where was she? And he said, do you want me to go out and find her for you? And I said, yeah, would you do that? And he went out and found Heather and came back and said, she's at a party, this party with, he went over to this girl's house and said, she's fine. And I'm like, oh, you know, but that's, I just can't even believe right now I was terrified. So, well, you, and we talk about you, you're catastrophizing and we catastrophize after a catastrophe has actually happened. Right, exactly. And yeah. I was afraid to have my kids drive because he was killed in an automobile accident, you know? And I just had to buck it up and say, okay, you can take driver's ed, you know? And that's, say, two years later. So, you know, you've got these little fears. Uh, Kalia says, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that name. I would imagine it's Hawaiian, Hawaiian, because you're saying mahalo for the insight. I'm at the two year mark. I'm trying to figure out the, I'm trying to figure out the moving forward for me, my, for, for my sons who are both fathers. How do I help them get through Father's Day? Their dad passed away, as I mentioned earlier. I love rituals. I really do. I don't think you just, I think you can have a ritual to celebrate the day. And one of the rituals I love is to have people maybe write down something about their dad and, or, and if they've got kids, they're the kids write something or draw a picture and then you take it all and you burn it and you make ash out of it and you bought a rose bush and you go plant the rose bush to celebrate father's day. So some ritual like that. The rituals are so powerful. So we have a lot of people on here who have had a loved one die from COVID. Mm. They weren't able to say goodbye. They weren't able to have the ritual. Do you have thoughts for people who aren't able to have that rituals now that serve us so much? Like the funeral, the memorial. Well, let me say they didn't get a chance to say goodbye. Just let me stop with that a minute. What would you have said if you could see him right now? What would you say? You say I love you, right? They knew. Did they know you love you? Yeah, they knew it. So the fact that you didn't get to say goodbye, they knew it. So there you you know. So don't worry about that piece. But I I'm one who believes that you need to um, do something right now. Um, you know, with the corona, uh, some people are going to have celebrations of life later on. I think that's fine, but I think you need to do something right now. I think you need to write a letter, do a rose, do uh, something, uh, maybe have everybody write an email or, you know, do something to remember that person now. And then later on, if you want to do something, that's fine. But do something right now that's important to you in connection with that person. Uh, and, and the other thing I've heard, you know, I always say people in grief are our teachers. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've been taught is so many people who have had a virtual funeral or memorial mm -hmm. have told me how disturbing it was when they looked out and they saw someone in a tank top shirt and a lazy boy chair. They saw someone else at work stapling while they're at their loved one's funeral. So I tell people, if you're going to do something virtual, tell people to treat it with all the reverence of a funeral. Right. Yeah. I you love dress sure. up to mm -hmm. not be at work and doing your paperwork. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a gift that when I stood in front of people, and some people are on here, I seen. Stephen, who was an amazing support to me, when I looked out of the uh, the memorial and saw the faces of everyone who was there when my son died, that was so meaningful. And if you're going to look out at Zoom and see someone in a tank top, right, 
who's texting someone else and someone who's stapling at work, it it's not the same. No, it's not. It's very it's very weird. In fact, when you when you think about it, yeah, I totally agree. So you got to show up at a virtual funeral with all the reverence you would. That's right. That's right. And uh, yeah, you know what, David? I think you just said something that's important. Sometimes we have to teach people to be good grief support. And I know you're going to hate to do that, but that's the reality. If you want it, you need to tell people what it is you need to be good grief support for me. And if people are saying you need to get over it, you can say that's not good grief support for me. That's not what I need. I, and I love the idea that you tell people if you're going to come to the memorial or the funeral, please dress appropriately. And these days you can fake it with a shirt. You could have, you could be in your shorts and no one would know, but that, put a nice black shirt on and right. everyone would sit there. I agree. Mary says, I didn't say I have a wonderful daughter and six beautiful grandchildren, but I lost my parents 10 months apart. And then my husband four years ago, I am an only child and I feel like so many are gone. I do worry about losing more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And well, I'll let you. Do you have something you want to say? Because there's something I always say to that. But no, I want to hear what you say. <laughs> I'm going to give you the reality. You are going to lose more. Either someday other people are going to die or you are going to die. So we don't have control over that. But we do have control over what we do between now and then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Gloria, I'm going to die someday. You're going to die someday. Right. I don't want that to ruin this moment we're having. Mm -hmm. I agree. And let me say that there are so many friends to be made in the world. When people tell me that they are alone, if you are feeling like you are alone, go to your community center, take right. a class, do something. There are many, many people to meet in this world. There are many beautiful people that you can, of course, it's not going to be like your husband or your parents, but still go to your community center, take a chair yoga class, go hang out with some people. There are lots of people that are looking, that are very nice and kind. And I just think there are a lot of new friends. Of course, it won't be like your friends you went to high school with or whatever, but you know, you got to do the best. Don't we have the expectation that the people who are closest to us should be the best grief support? Sometimes they're not. No, that's true. <laughs> Sometimes they are truly not. Sometimes they're in pain. Right. So time flies when you and I talk. <laughs> Tell me about how we find you, what you're up to, open to hope, the conference. Tell us all about stuff. Okay. Well, you have something exciting going on I want everyone to know about. <laughs> You can find us at opentohope.com and our mission is helping people find hope after loss and giving a voice to grief and recovery. And there have been so many conferences and events canceled that my uh, Open to Hope community, my family, uh, have decided that we are going to sponsor a conference and it's an international grief conference, finding hope during uncertain times. And it's going to be great. David's going to be speaking there. And we are going to have some wonderful people. We're going to have Eben Alexander, who wrote, um, um, uh, let's see, what is there is, a, oh, finding, what's heaven? It's about, right, I forget it's about David, heaven. Right, about, about, but, uh, uh, heaven is real. Right. Heaven is real. Neurosurgeon, he's, he's fabulous. And we're going to have Ken Druck, who did the Gina Druck Foundation. He's fabulous. And we're just going to have a... Uh, a whole bunch of wonderful speakers. We're going to have a panel if you uh, like the um, afterlife kinds of things. We're going to have Raymond Moody is going to be on and Bill Guggenheim. And uh, they're just going to be some of the great people in grief, loss, and recovery. So you can go to opentohope.com or you can go to Open to Hope Grief Conference. And it's want to tell you it's free. It's free to free. all and of you. this is going to be on Facebook, correct? Yep, it's going to be on if Facebook. If you're watching yeah. us, it's going to be on Facebook. So you'll, you're already on Facebook if you're watching us. <laughs> right. And we're going to have it on Facebook. It's going to be all day long. And it is on the 22nd of next of June. It's going to start at 830 in the morning California time. And it's going to run till 4 o'clock. And I hope you'll all stay till 4 o'clock. 
three o'clock, we're going to have a candle lighting. So I hope you'll all join us and get your candles. And our friend Alan Peterson's going to sing. It's it's just going to be a wonderful, wonderful event. And Heidi and I are on podcasts. We actually have over a million people listening to our podcast now, which is kind of amazing a year. And uh, we're just so happy that we can help people with grief, loss, and recovery because I don't know, David, I don't know how people have found, but it's very hard to get people to talk about grief recovery. It's hard to get it on television. It's hard to get in the media. They want to hear all the horror stories. They don't want to hear about how people have recovered, what they're doing to recover. And David is so blessed that you do this for people because it's just not there. I mean, there is hope. It's, there's a great life out there for you. Well, you and I have learned something about this world. If you're going to ask people permission, if you can do it, you're going to hear no. So we've just created our own stuff. Yeah, exactly right. Because we're never going to get the yes we want. People aren't going to get it. Yeah. So and, I, and I want to say uh, to people, not now because you're taking care of yourself. These people that are in early grief, you're in that first year, your second year, and then moving on to your third year. When you can start moving out to help other people, uh, it really will make a huge difference in your life. And you will do that. You will have find opportunities to help other people. They're all over the place. But don't do it too early. You're the number one right now. And, and you're giving other people the opportunity to be a service, which is such a blessing. Yeah, and I love seeing people in the group that there are people who are early on that are talking about their pain. Mm -hmm. There, you know, I, I say people are posting about their pain, which is so important. Grief must be witnessed. And I always say to people when they post that they're having an okay day, please do that. Yeah, it gives other people hope that yeah. every day is not going to be gut wrenching. Right. And every moment is not going to be, we're not built to grieve 24 seven. Right. So there are some wonderful things in the, in the world. So let me make sure we have it open to hope.com. Mm -hmm. That's where we can go. It's June 22nd. Uh, yep. Uh, open to, by the way, on open to hope.com, we've got tons of material for you. We've got radio shows. We've got TV shows that we've done. We've got articles. We've Everything's tagged for content. So if you've lost a spouse, you don't have to read about child loss. I mean, it's uh, it's really a rich site that we've got available for you. Yeah, and our conference is on June 22nd. It's the International Grief Conference, Finding Hope During Uncertain Times. And as we said, David's going to be speaking there. So you're going to definitely... Love amazing speakers you have so I'm, I'm really thrilled to be a part of them so and we are thrilled to have you thank you so much for all the work you've done for like i said you were you were an elder to me not in age but in grief <laughs> in age I, also david <laughs> uh, well, i don't know about that but i so appreciate all you've done and uh, you and heidi are the best and you are a walking demonstration of um, living with loss and healing with loss and, you know, helping us to be open to hope. Can I give so, you my closing line? Yes, please. <laughs> my closing line. And I want to say to all of you that if you've lost hope, please lean on mine until you find your own. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. All right. We have lots of amazing other people coming up this week and next week. So come here. I'll let you know. I'll post every day, whether it's 5 or 6 p.m. And uh, I know Paul's going to be doing grief yoga again. So awesome. lots of good things coming up. Thank you so much, Gloria. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I will see you soon. Good. Take care of yourself. Okay. Take care of yourself, too, David. Bye-bye. Love you. Bye.